I want to welcome you to the February 2018 meeting of Citizens Water Advocacy Group. We have a really nice program planned for you today. Uh, Walt Anderson is going to speak with us, or to us, and then take questions afterward. Uh, Walt Anderson is a faculty member at Prescott College. He is a naturalist of old caste and modern times, the next generation of a proud and ancient lineage with field experience spanning the globe. Walt teaches and advises on natural history, ecology, wildlife management, wetland ecology and management, interpreting nature through art and philosophy or photography, ecotourism and field biology. He lives in Granite Dells and is active in efforts to preserve the area for all citizens. And I give you CWAG member Walt Anderson. Welcome everyone. It's a delight to be here. A couple days ago I was in Tanzania <laughs> and so it's quite a shift. But I'm glad to be back because I love this area and I particularly love Granite Dells which is one of our great resources in the community and in the whole state. And when I was in Africa, I was reminded again and again how important wild lands and wildlife are for economies, for aesthetics, and for community-based conservation. And one of the things you see here on the title is a threatened community resource. So we as a community, we as citizens, like the Citizens Water Advocacy Group, are the ones who have to step forward. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of uh, activism for open space as we go along. My objectives in the talk today are four. I want to share the distinctive values of the Granite Dells and Granite Creek, which runs through the Dells, provide some historical context on recreation and conservation here, and describe the proposed development that Gary mentioned in the heart of the Dells, Arizona Eco Development, and suggest action steps to protect this community resource. It's easy to take the Granite Dells and the lakes for granted. They're there. They see, they've been there, the Dells have been there for 1.4 billion years, long before any of us and long after we're all gone. But we should not take it for granted. It is a stunning landscape of national park quality, but much of it remains privately owned and is unprotected, which many people don't seem to realize. This serene landscape is in the crosshairs of development pressures, a view from the Peabine Trail of the landscape that is under threat from Arizona Eco Development. Many of you may have read in the Courier back in September, Cindy Bark's comments, homes could spring up soon near the Granite Dell's iconic point of rocks, as well as along portions of the popular Peavine Trail as a part of Arizona Eco Development project. Nearly 4,000 homes are proposed. And this is following the 10,500 homes of the Deep Well Ranch. This is gonna make a significant change in the nature of this community. This is a wake-up call for what we see here may in the future look more like this. This is right out there along the Peavine Trail and it is the Granite Dells Estates. Now is that what we want in the future for Granite Dells? I, I hope not, not me anyway. So today's decisions will become tomorrow's history. This landscape and many of the landscapes I show you here are in the crosshairs. This is right where the development will occur. But we do have a chance and a responsibility to help shape that future. And that's why we need all of you to step forward as citizens because this is so important to our future. Arizona Eco Development website says some very good things and I hope that they are true. We acknowledge and believe that whatever we do with this land must be sensitive to local needs and the concerns of the area's citizens. That's great, that's our invitation. <laughs> Whoops, where'd the text go? There's supposed to be text here. All right, things, things happen. <laughs> this is our invitation and our obligation to step forward and to assure that they hear our voices of what we want and we can influence what they do with this property. This is what's at stake. All of this land here with the Peavine Trail, Iron King Trail going through here is right in the midst of this proposed development. Well, our iconic Granite Dells is an island of wild beauty in an ever-developing urban setting in the Quad Cities. 
The geological diversity here boggles the mind, and I'll just give you a few examples, but everywhere you go, it's different. It's just amazing, the diversity. It the formations here have Lisagong rings, a nice German term, but that's a pretty rare phenomenon where these, uh, during the cooling process, these rings form that have such a distinctive shape. And uh, we don't see this in Granite Mountain. We don't see this in the other granite formations around here. It's unique to the Granite Dells and a few other places on the globe. There are crystals there. Uh, Sedona doesn't have a monopoly on crystals. <laughs> <laughs> and so there are many, many other things you can discover if you look carefully in this landscape. And it's beautiful at all times of year, all times of day, all seasons. The moon rising over the Dells here or in a driving rainstorm, something I hope we get before the winter's over. <laughs> we are sure lacking that. Or the snowstorm, again, providing moisture. It's a marvelous landscape, and it's really good for the soul to get out there. There's a lot of history here, too, and I'll be mentioning some of this during the talk, not in great detail, but surely the history of this place is an important factor as well. And wildlife is abundant. So let me show you a few examples of the wildlife that occur out there. And, and these are some of the small creatures, the pocket gophers, the chipmunks, the squirrels, the mice, the pack rats. Many of you don't like pack rats, but I think they're, I think they're really cute. There's a, my little pack rat up there. I kind of like them, except when they wreck your car. And javelinas, of course. Yeah, you don't like those either? Well, they are wildlife. <laughs> and of course deer. This is actually taken from the Peavine Trail, right on the property that's in contention here. There, are, there were seven deer there, I think six show up in this picture. That's taken right from the trail. And bobcats occur out there. That was taken right actually from my deck. <laughs> and uh, it's, this is one of the last places where you can see this kind of wildlife in the developing urban area. Mountain lions are there too. We usually see the sign, the skulls, the skeletons, the scat. This is the friendly lion from the desert, Sonoran Desert Museum, because <laughs> I, I have not had the opportunity to get that close to one in Granite Dells. But some people have seen them out there, and uh, it's really a delight to know that something this magnificent still survives in this area. And the deer, too, are magnificent. I think the deer are really a great threat under this development. Part of it is because they need water, food and shelter like any other type of wildlife. And here's a stock pond that occurs on this very property at this time. It's a vital water source. That won't be there if houses come through here. They won't have water. When roads come in, they fragment wildlife habitat and there's significant collateral damage. The deer here was killed right next to Watson Woods and it was hit multiple times by cars that refused to stop. Refused, even though it was in the daytime, it crossed from the side of the road by the church there. Everybody could see it. This poor woman stopped and is crying because she saw this happen and nobody cared. She and a couple other people pulled the deer off the road. Really tragic, but that's part of the damage that occurs when you fragment and disturb a habitat by building roads through it. Something we could expect. And housing developments bring domestic predators and competitors for wildlife. Lovely little tabby is great in your house, <laughs> but once tabby gets outside, tabby eats the little rodents, eats the birds, the ground nesting birds particularly, or ground feeding birds, like many of these. All of these would be at risk with the abundance of cats likely to be associated with a big development. And these little birds are really delightful to behold, like the little uh, bridal titmouse, or the ravens that fly over. And of course, this is owl country. Lots of owls out there. Really want you to be aware of the beautiful wildlife that occurs here, all of which would be compromised by a major development in this area. And the birds of prey. Bald eagles, of course, feed at the lakes, fly through the dells. But golden eagles occur here too, and they're a rare species. They actually nest in granite dells. Not many people know that and red-tailed hawks, Cooper's hawks, sharp shin. Uh, along the creek, we have the common black hawk, which is anything but common. This is the northern end of their range, more or less. And uh, peregrine falcons nest in granite dells. 
Magnificent creatures, nearly extinct because of the use of hard pesticides in the past, but are making a rebound, and we're lucky to have them here. And then the little American kestrel, little charming bird. Uh, within the last month, down at Granite Creek, I was able to photograph these waterfowl. Beautiful wood ducks. This is one of only two places in the state where wood ducks nest, here in the Verde Valley. Only two places in the, in the state. And the mallards and the cinnamon teal and hooded mergansers and gadwalls and other birds use the creek as well. Then I'll mention a few of the other maybe less conspicuous animals, like this little piece of animated granite called the <laughs> canyon tree frog. Beautiful Sonoran Mountain king snake, lovely, harmless, a mimic of the coral snake, which is very rare. The gopher snake, certain to raise your uh, blood pressure just a little bit if they startle you out there, but they're totally harmless. Clark's spiny lizard, I think Clarkdale must have been named for that. <laughs> the plateau lizard, the eastern collared lizard, look at those greens and yellows, I suspect that's what collared greens were named for. <laughs> Probably not. And such a diversity of invertebrates, including here just some examples of some of the beautiful butterflies. I've gotten quite into butterflies over the last few years, and uh, Granadelles has tremendous diversity. And of course, diverse vegetation. We have a Native Plant Society group, and they often uh, enjoy discovering the delights of the vegetation in Granadelles, including various trees and shrubs and grasses and wonderful wildflowers. And I have thousands of pictures of wildflowers of many, many different species, and that's a whole nother talk. I have a talk called Plant Parenthood, or Do Violets Have Blue Jeans? <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes I change the title and call it The Sex Life of Plants. Isn't it appalling? <laughs> <laughs> so among the plants here you can see uh, various ferns, lichens, mosses, cacti, many, many different things. All in all, this is a unique and precious landscape, too valuable to lose as a community asset. And that's why I think a lot of you are here. Prescott is growing, and certainly there have been growing pains. The, I took this from up on Thumb Butte, and it was really pretty shocking to see some years ago. And it was also shocking to the local citizenry. The, the city council took some heat for this kind of development. Future quality of life depends on visionary planning and thoughtful, adaptive implementation of plans. Plans are only so good they have to be implemented, of course, properly. So open space initiatives in Prescott. I want to refer to this a little bit because I've been very involved with it over the years. The question you have to ask is how has the city of Prescott managed its natural assets, basically the resources that make this place a good quality of life? How has it managed it? Has it demonstrated vision and leadership? Has what we've got a lucky accident? Or is it a result of resistance overcome by the citizenry? To early settlers, the forest was an obstacle and a resource. They had to create some, quote, open space to build their homes, gardens, and businesses. That's the way it used to be. They brought major changes to the landscape in the name of progress. You notice among the changes here, the cow stands out pretty well compared to the deer, which blends into the landscape and is the natural part of what was here. Prescott is now an urban area and a rapidly growing one particularly now with the development proposals <coughs> that are going to change this community forever. But the pioneer mentality hangs on. I think you've all seen that in Whiskey Row and other things. We sort of glorify the past, the past in which we developed and exploited our resources and didn't necessarily look to the future. I like to say the future is not what it used to be. <laughs> and wildlife populations are not what they used to be either. Oh, yeah, you want to see that again? <laughs> okay. Well, the forests have changed dramatically. We know that the big um, savannas of old-growth trees with lots of grasses around them before that we had here in the early days have now been changed. Most of that old growth has been logged off. It's come back with dog hair stands of second growth. It's not natural in density, and of course, it's a high fire risk because fire ecology no longer operates the way it used to here. Something we all have to be concerned about. Uh, Prescott is in the midst of a tinderbox. 
And the drought that we're having right at the moment is not helping. The Prescott National Forest provides some beauty and recreation very close to town, and that's wonderful. There's grand, iconic Granite Mountain, which we all know and love. But to some in the city, the presence of that nearby forest and lots of undeveloped land, as it has been, seems sufficient for outdoor recreation demand. They seem to be unable to envision the future in which urban growth was going to occur and the presence of open space and uh, recreational assets would be diminished by that growth. There you can see the granite dells surrounded by the growing town. Some neighborhoods where I used to live near Thumb Butte retained the vegetation, not all natural, but still with good wildlife numbers, pleasant walking, and so forth, while other developments transformed the land completely into minimalist green accents. This is shocking to me. I would not want to bring my children up here. Mass grading for houses, much like an open pit mine, not working with the landscape at all, but modifying, terraforming the landscape to uh, create housing development like this. Oh no, <laughs> what happened to the language here? Well, I, I, here is the history of Acker Park, 1955. <laughs> Uh, I don't know where the words went, but they're out there somewhere. In 1955, Acker donated land to the city for uh, recreation, for parkland, and for music, and for children. That was in 1955. About, that was good for about 40 years, 38 years. And then the city, Acker Trust, wanted to sell that land for development because it would bring money into the city. Well, the citizens arose in protest they formed uh, Save the Ackers group. Sounds kind of familiar to the Save the Dells group. And they managed to turn things around and to acquire that 80-acre thing. This was citizen action that was very, very effective and it was delightful to see. So citizens can do something. Acker Park would be gone today and it would be houses or other development if it weren't for citizens stepping up. In 1985, the Heritage Fund was passed. Money was available by the state for state parks and for uh, land acquisition. The Arizona Nature Conservancy with Dan Campbell running it at the time, he's been a citizen of Prescott for many years, they proposed a Barry Goldwater State Park for the Granadelles. They had money, they had interest, but the public didn't even know about it and the mayor at that time dismissed the proposal. The Nature Conservancy and the state took their money to Dead Horse State Park, to Tonto Bridge, and to other sites, and Prescott never even knew what they lost. That was an amazing opportunity. We could have had a state park there. And imagine the value of that for our economy and recreation. Strickland Park in 1997 on Butte Creek was actually a gift to the city from private citizens and restoration work by Prescott Audubon. So Prescott Audubon has been the steward of that particular very valuable park and it's a, a good example of a private-public partnership. They work with the city. Well, <coughs> houses started sprouting around Thumb Butte, and this particular house <laughs> raised the ire of the public as well because it uh, seemed to violate codes, <laughs> but, <laughs> but they called this a cooling tower, and they had various types of loopholes that they escaped through, and this big house came up. But what it did is the Central Arizona Land Trust was forming at that time, and it became their first project. There was a big scar that was gouged in that, neighbor, in that area so that Thumb Butte was marred by this enormous scar. And so this was their first project. I was on their board uh, at that time. We bought five lots to protect the views. We raised a couple hundred thousand dollars and the city matched it. So it was a good uh, private-public partnership. And the uh, Central Arizona Land Trust held a conservation easement, and now thanks to restoration work, that scar is no longer visible. So that's another good example of where citizenry stepped up and through a nonprofit was able to achieve a desirable result. And the idea of a conservation easement is that it's in perpetuity. I think it's really important that land be protected for long term so that the whims of different city councils or mayors may not change <laughs> that particular thing. In 1998, the city acquired Watson and Willow Lakes from the Chino Valley Irrigation District. What a wonderful move this was, because it gave us recreation and wildlife habitat uh, 
that we all enjoy today. And of course, we take it for granted. But before that, the lake was drained for irrigation every summer, and uh, it was sort of an eyesore. And now what we see out there is a tremendous uh, ecological and recreational resource. 1999, Prescott Peavine Trail was completed, a Rails to Trails project, another great success in this area. It's our most popular trail. It's a national recreation trail. Very, very important for our economy and for those of us who live here. Well, guess what? It runs right through the Arizona Eco Development. And we take it for granted, that beautiful scenery. But unless we are careful, unless we can work with the developer to assure that houses don't spring up on both sides of this trail and the Iron King Trail, we could lose this. It could be simply a trail through an urban jungle. So Prescott is indeed blessed with stunning natural settings, with the granite dells there as the backdrop. How lucky we are, but we can't take it for granted. Big changes were coming at that time, uh, around 1999 when I started there. You saw this picture before of the development. And everybody's hometown was being sacrificed at the altar of consumerism. The Real Estate Research Corporation, which should know about these things, said there is no greater risk to land values than unrestrained development. It's true. Unrestrained development destroys land values. It doesn't add to them. Controlled development can increase, and especially with open space values, because it gives you much more money for your bang for your buck. So in 2000, the citizens fearing the trends voted to, to tax themselves 1% for open space acquisition and for road improvements. And they assumed, and they were basically promised by the council at that time, that uh, about 50% would go to each, to open space and to roads. There were public forums in 2002 and set the priorities and the plans for the use of this sales tax revenue. The priority areas for acquisition are listed here. They're gone. I don't know where they went. <laughs> But uh, the first one was for the Granite Dells and the lakes. There's no question about it. That was the highest priority. The next three on this non-existent list <laughs> were related to uh, uh, the, the state lands that we have around us, uh, uh, Glassford Hill and uh, the uh, Pea Mountain and things like that. And then there was the Dalkey land with the petroglyphs and then the greenways in town. Boy, it's a good thing I remember that. <laughs> It's coming up. Okay. Thank you for asking. So Mayor Simmons appointed the first Open Space Acquisition Advisory Committee members in 2003. They were volunteers and can only make recommendations. I served on that committee for many years. Open Space Acquisition Advisory Committee. However, the city prioritized roads while Prescott experienced a growth boom, which of course meant that many open space opportunities were lost as real estate prices skyrocketed, as you know they did prior to the Depression. And so many of us were upset. We had opportunities to acquire land, and that land was lost because of higher rising prices. Then the Growing Smarter Act and the Arizona Preserve Initiative, called API, gave the city hope that the state lands could be acquired for open space, like Glassford Hill. This kind of diverted attention to the state lines and away from, from some of the private lands in town. There's Badger or Pea Mountain. Don't ever put those two together, those two words. <laughs> it's, not, it's not his name. Those are alternate names, not part of the same name. They moved the non-state lands down the priority list. And unfortunately, some beautiful properties right here in town uh, were not acquired during that time because the emphasis shifted to the state lands. But. A lawsuit scuttled the Arizona Preserve Initiative. All of that hope that we had for acquiring these uh, open space lands disappeared. They were not available for open space because they are meant to be used for supporting schools and things like that. At that time, they thought this would be a very good use of the open space lands, but a uh, lawsuit scuttled that. Dorothy Dalkey, there we go. Uh, an octogenarian who was a real fan, a real uh, supporter of the community. She wanted to save her family's 40 acres in the midst of town for development. So Prescott College began to purchase it, and uh, you can see the petroglyphs there. Somebody chipped away something. That's my young son who's now over 30 years old. 
But uh, they wanted to create an environmentally sensitive campus close to town. But unfortunately, the college lost the property through some shenanigans. The Dalkey family and the citizens tried to get the city council at the time to buy it for open space rather than lose it for housing. But the city at the time turned down that opportunity. They had the money. They turned it down because they were putting it all into roads. Last minute efforts fail. The iconic petroglyph site becomes surrounded in Enchanted Canyon. Lovely name, Enchanted Canyon. In November 2006, development of Enchanted Canyon begins. And I had been taking classes up in there. We were absolutely shocked by the uh, devastation that was occurring in a very, very important place. So a lot of people got really annoyed, and, and, and they reacted to this. The city council was chastened by the public reaction, and they began to listen to the Open Space <laughs> Acquisition Advisory Committee on, to a better extent. And we were able to get some big wins after that. One of the things they did was they were working on a parks master plan, and they did a needs assessment report. There should be a hyphen in there, but they left that out. Anyway, needs and, and the community feedback gave this. Acquire land, uh, these are the highest priorities, very supportive, somewhat supportive, and so forth. Acquire land to preserve open space, develop new walking and hiking trails, acquire land to develop new trails. Those ranked among the highest of the values. So the citizens expressed their desires again. And the committee evolved, earned respect and support, and was kind of a heady time to be on that committee. So let's define open space as that committee was working on it. We define it as land with conservation values that qualify it to be preserved permanently from development. And it has many positive factors, including sustainable economic development, such as ecotourism, a great support for the town. It has preservation of historic and prehistoric culture, which I think is very important to the values of a community. It has water, floodplain, and watershed preservation. Very important to CWAG members, I know, as it is open space does everywhere. It allows human connection to nature taking us away a little bit from our devices, from the roads, from the busyness of life, connecting us to nature, which is our spiritual foundation. It provides non-consumptive recreation. Non-consumptive. It's going to be there for a long period of time. It provides for education and research. The uh, Prescott Lakes, uh, Grant, uh, Watson and Willow Lakes and Watson Woods are a, an important bird area for the state with the Audubon Society and the Bird Conserva Conservancy, American Bird Conservancy. And we've been doing a lot of research on waterfowl populations and other things out there. Very, very important stuff. And of course, it provides inspiration. We have to inspire or we expire. Right. And wildlife habitat. So. This committee developed an open space master plan, working together, relying on some state and regional models that were really very good, and we were very proud of the <coughs> product that we produced. I think it's one of the best probably in the state. It cost the city practically nothing. All they had to do was print some copies and put it in their files and so forth. It was all volunteer work. And here it is. It was adopted by the city five to two on the council and became an expansion of the Parks and Rec Master Plan of 2007. Parks and Rec still uses this plan with its modifications, and I'm really happy to see that it didn't just get put away in the file. They're actually referring to it, and I commend Parks and Recreation for this. Notice this down at the bottom. You probably can't read it. Preserving Prescott, Prescott's Natural Resource Heritage. That's what it's all about. There's the plan components. I don't know how this <laughs> happened. This is so <laughs> weird. How could this happen? But anyway, there's a storm in the Dells. <laughs> <laughs> Referring to the storm ranch, I'm sure. Anyway, the plan components, of course, included things like public participation, uh, follow-up, the committee structure, and things like that. And here are all the characteristics on the right-hand side. <laughs> we developed a matrix to establish priorities, and we actually went out and walked the land, the committee walked the land many places around town where we looked at the ecological, uh, archaeological, historic, connectivity, buffer zones, 
We looked at uh, many, many other factors, and then we ranked everything on that. And so we came up with scores so that it wouldn't simply be arbitrary, maybe something that some person politically wanted to promote as open space. We wanted it one that reflected the most values, and that's what we worked at. So there's the matrix over there. <laughs> and our acquisition strategies. This is so interesting. <laughs> well, there are many, many ways. Uh, we can ac acquire money. We can use um, zoning regulations. We can, on a planned area development, 25% goes to open space and things like that. So the acquisition strategies were developed and explained in detail in this master plan. As I said, planned area developments require a minimum of 25% designated open space. Here is a group of the committee meeting with a developer to look at the landscape and try to assure that that 25% open space is functional open space and not strictly uh, borders along roads or the interiors of roundabouts and things like that, <laughs> which in this case, it actually turned out to be, <laughs> sadly enough. And uh, one of the recommendations was to establish an open space commission, dissolve the committee and turn it into an open space commission on the par with other commissions that we have where they could have had some real clout in development. So we want functional open space. And, uh, well, all my captions just disappeared here. So um, we believe that recreation like this is necessary, but it's a complement to the open space things. So the priorities were determined by the values and characteristics, the opportunity we had, and the urgency or degree of threat. So we looked at all those things, and then we made recommendations to the city council. City council then acted, and some open space lands were acquired, some along Granite Creek, for example, 25 acres in 2001, another 28 acres in 2005, and here and there, some more acres were added. Gill Hill, east of the Thumb Butte, and we call it Gill Hill because the gills uh, were the very active proponents of saving this particular hill uh, out near Sherwood Drive. In 2001, 32 acres were uh, saved there because that little hill right in front of Thumb Butte was going to have roads up it and houses all over it. So they saved that. White Spar Creekside Open Space Reserve uh, on the White Spar Road going out of town, south of town, was preserved through donation. Community Nature Center was preserved, 18 acres, and the Community Nature Center moved out to the high, become the Highlands Nature Center out by Lynx Creek, which you know, Lynx Lake. In 2006, there was a big move. Chris Hoskins was hired as a trail specialist, and Chris has been a marvel at recruiting volunteers, again, to save money for the city, and very effective at building trails and advocating for open space. And, and I want to commend the open, Over the Hill Gang. How many of you here are members of the Over the Hill Gang? I know there's a few. <laughs> All right. we, we don't think you're really over the hill yet, but uh, we're certainly <laughs> grateful for the work that you put into building trails and protecting this and working with Chris. The Hissacota parcel in the Dells was acquired in uh, 2007. The Rody Grounds open space was right here in the urban area, that uh, four acres of hill right near the rodeo grounds was acquired in 2007 with some trades with and uh, exchange of money with the county. Granite Gardens, 36 acres, was acquired in 2008. And you can see it has both riparian values and the rocky uh, areas that are really important for climbing, the high rappel dells there. And Granite Gardens is a good example of an unexpected opportunity. That is, it wasn't one that was necessarily on a radar screen immediately. It had historical values. Here's some pictures of the boating lake back in 1939. There was a health camp there. This was very important in the history of the town. There's some 1936 bathing beauties. <laughs> we had our own pageants here in the Dells. And uh, that beautiful lake, there it is in 2003. Jim Lawrence took that photo and then in 2006, Developer came in and without getting permits from the Corps of Engineers, foolishly, uh, filled it, drained and filled it for condos and things like that. Well, this uh, neighbor blew the whistle, Happy Oasis. Some of you may know she, she was a neighbor. She blew the whistle and uh, the Corps of Engineers stepped in and busted them. 
And so then they came to the open space, yeah, came to the open space acquisition advisory committee and we promoted it through the city. The city acquired uh, 35 acres as open space and now there's a nice trail system through there, uh, even stairs on one of the trails and uh, it is saved from homes and condos. And uh, so we can thank Happy for that in part, but the open space advisory committee was big on pushing this acquisition. And then restoration began. Didn't want to put it back into a, a mosquito infested lake because that wasn't the original condition. We tried to get it back to a riparian area. So uh, a restoration company was employed, restoration begins, and now it's a beautiful forest out there. And it's really, really important for, this, there's the high rappel dells there and for climbing. That's John Flicker, our college president, climbing the rock there. <laughs> and he's all by himself. You would think maybe he'd be a social climber, but. <laughs> 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 oh, here's the title <laughs> for the James Parcel. The James Parcel was acquired by the date that you see there at the top. Right? <laughs> this is right across from the Fippen Museum. Beautiful landscape, Constellation Trail there. A uh, wonderful place. The Green Parcel along uh, the road that goes through the Dells 89 was acquired in 2008 and it came with funds for operation and maintenance. Boy. I wasn't living out there at the time, but I saw this storm developing in the monsoon season and it rushed out there and uh, was able to capture some pretty amazing light. So the plan recommendations were to adopt the open space master plan, <coughs> the, of course, and implement it, replace it with a permanent open space commission, establish an open space foundation, which has not happened yet, partner with government agencies and other cities to create a regional urban interface plan, Review and revise ordinances to increase incentives. Analyze cost and benefit of purchase development rights and transfer development credits. These are programs by which you can uh, acquire or save land. Review and update the master plan within five years of its adoption. That plan has been reviewed and is still being used by the city, fortunately. And then conduct outreach and get citizen support. And make open space permanent, such as with conservation easements. We recommend an open space commission because they have more influence on this uh, par with planning and zoning and the historical commissions. And they're also less vulnerable to the whims of a mayor because they would be appointed by a council instead of by a mayor. Council agreed. They agreed to uh, replace our committee with an open space commission. We're very excited about this. This was sort of the peak of our enthusiasm because things happen. Wow, listen to that. In August 2009, Kukendall upsets incumbent Mayor Wilson. Wilson, in a fit of pique, I think, dissolved the Open Space Committee, and Kukendall does not renew it. So at the time that the committee should have been converted to a commission, it was all dissolved, went away. But some of us refused to let the dream die, and we formed the nonprofit Granite Dells Preservation Foundation, which still exists today. We incorporated in 2010. That's Dan Campbell in the middle and Jim Lawrence on the right. So we were on that original committee and we formed a new group called the Grand Dells Preservation Foundation, which is a nonprofit. Our uh, goals were to protect ecological and scenic integrity, partnering to enhance land management, educating on historical, cultural, and ecological values, advising and enhancing recreation and tourism, which we feel are very important, and fundraising for all of the above. And then public education. Jim Lawrence provided these images. That's Jim, right there, when he was a little kid, <laughs> out there. And of course, Tom Mix, uh, the Tom Mix was in the mix back in the early days uh, on the history of the Dells. Well, that's interesting. And then of course, here's the recreation side of it. We had the wonderful trail system, lots of recreation. Well, I, I heard from uh, Chris Hosking that trail usage in Prescott was over 800,000 visits last year. And it's increasing 10% annually. This is big. This is really big. And there's the acquisition, or, uh, the, the plea for funds for acquisition. So obviously recreation demands are huge here in this city. We want to know whether recreation is compatible with wildlife and I believe that if it's well managed, we can have both. 
Here you can have a sailboat out here with waterfowl in the foreground. Uh, Space-time zoning can, can do a lot. And then habituation of the wildlife can also happen so that they can occur there. We all know that birding is big business, brings millions of dollars to communities around the state and around the country, around the world, as are other forms of outdoor recreation. And here you can see many of them here. There are bike races, road races, running, all sorts of opportunities that bring you know, values to the local citizens and also people from outside who spend their money here. And that is good for us. Let's look a little bit of the history of the 1% uh, tax revenue because I think this is entirely relevant at this point. So in uh, 1996 they or 1995, they projected this yellow line here that uh, about $5 million a year would come in from the open space tax, the open space and roads tax. We can see there the actuals exceeded that in all years. That's the blue line here. And then they upped the projection in 2000 to this higher level here. And even during the recession, the uh, amount of money that came in was far in excess of what they predicted. So their predictions of what should be available for open space and roads were based on the lower numbers there. And much more money came in because the community was growing. And uh, here was the intention. They intended 40.7 million uh, for open space and 34 0.3 million for roads. This is what happened. <laughs> that is what happened. About at the time that I did uh, that, this graph was made. Only about 16 million had been spent on open space and 175 million on roads. That's with that increase. Now, that did not fulfill the expectations of the public. No. Not at all. And it, it is really quite a shock. Uh, fortunately, there's been a little bit of expenditure since that time. But here you can see 2005 to 2011, the amount of revenue that came in here, the amount that was delegated to open space, the amount that was put on roads. Many years they spent more than actually came in during that year because there was funds left over from the previous year. But look at this, 2011, zero for open space, 20 million for roads. Uh, the only year that was good was 2009 and that was at the point that I mentioned earlier when there was that little bit of turnaround and they spent some money that year on open space. Well, anyway, this is a bit of a shock. The Granite Dells Foundation started focusing very hard on trying to preserve a key parcel in the Dells, and there was a lot of public support. The Chamber of Commerce was in support, many, many other groups and so forth, and a generous offer was made to acquire this 83-acre property. It was trying to get the old Granite Dells Resort into the open space system. The values that it had there on the matrix that we had constructed were the highest of all the lands that we looked at because the combination of historical, archaeological, ecological, hydrological, and other values that we had. So we were pretty hopeful and we had a buyer who was willing to buy it uh, for ECOSA at that time. Uh, the city had turned it down. The city had an opportunity to buy it. They turned it down. And then uh, ECOSA almost bought it. It's a site of great historical significance. How many of you went out to the old uh, Dells, Grand Dells Resort when it was operating with a swimming pool? <coughs> yeah, I see some hands here. So some of you know how important that area was historically. But the effort failed. And if we envision an interconnected regional park, which is the point I really want to make today, we need to act decisively now to save as much as possible of the Dells. Because once things are gone, you can't replace them. There's a lesson here. All parties must want the deal to succeed. Collaboration must break down the walls of polarization. And that's been my mantra ever since I worked in the Sutter Buttes of California, where we managed to get the ranchers there to open their lands for public access and interpretation. That's been going for over 40 years. I'm pretty happy with that. I want to see something like that happen here. Part of the Storm Ranch was recently acquired by the city. They just closed, I think, this last week or sometime. Very, that's very exciting. 160 acres of a 400 and some acre parcel were acquired. Not all, I wish we could have gotten it all, but 160 acres is good. Joe Baines said, the Granite Dells are unique to the United States and to be able to preserve this big chunk of land is just monumental. Let's see if we can make it more monumental by saving more of this land, okay? Mayor Mangarelli. I love hearing this quote. It's I think it's important to keep as much open space as possible 
in the Granite Dells. I hope the council agrees, and I know some of you are here today, and I hope that you will stand up for this because it is so important. This parcel that was acquired includes parts of Boulder Creek. It's a paradise back there, really beautiful. It's a wonderful acquisition, but much Dell's land is still vulnerable to development. You might wonder why there's pine trees out there in Granite Dells, because it's below the elevation you would expect pine trees. But ecologists know that cool air drainage occurs, and so sometimes things are supported lower than they would because of cool air drainage. But even more so, the Granite Dells are impervious to rain. The rock is impervious to rain, so the water runs off and fills the little dells, the little valleys in between, and provides more moisture uh, per acre because of that runoff, and so it will support the for pine forests out there. Chris Hosking, our trail specialist, and Joe Baines are strong proponents of trails in open space, and I give them a lot of credit. I think that they are going to be working with the developer. We need to help support them when they work with the developer because plans do change, and they can change, partly because of citizen participation. The Peabine Trail, uh, here's a sign that you can see along there. They actually used one of my etchings there, or an etching of one of my drawings in that interpretive thing. It's the most popular of Prescott's trails, and it's a national recreation trail. It's running right through this landscape. There are plans to extend it to connect with trails in Chino Valley. If it's done well, this trail will allow the continuing coexistence of pronghorns and people and other wildlife, grasshopper sparrows, for example. You may not think they're important, but they're rare and they occur along this trail. Or it could simply be another trail through a bunch of buildings like happened at Granite Dells Estates. So the functional integrity of the grasslands will depend on how the development is planned and they'll be a crucial partner in efforts to keep the peabine as our vital recreation asset. The reason those captions were there is because it shows you these beautiful landscape and you can see what it looks like now with and envision what it would look like with houses over it. Question? Oh, I had a question about the open space funds. I had heard that initially the voters had voted purely for that to be open space money and open space taxation, and that then it was added uh, later or at the last minute that it was also for roads. Can you speak on that? Yeah, I think they had uh, an initiative primarily for roads and it failed. And so then they wanted to so they piggyback roads and open space together because people wanted the open space, so they approved it and the roads came along with it. But then the shift occurred after that when the emphasis was put on roads instead of on open space. This is from near the Fippin Museum, along the highway there. You can see the Peavine Trail running through there. This is the valley of Granite Creek in the foreground. A point of Rocks, which is right here, which is an important landmark. Glassford Hill up above and so forth. So this is the area in question. Another view of it, Granite Dells Estates over here. This is a big house at the edge of it. They have more land and they will extend that development out here. So that's pretty well gone. And it's right along the Peavine Trail. Their website says, and this is encouraging to see if we can, um, if we can trust it or if we can hold them to it, Maximize open space, preserving the point of rock, should be point of rocks, as well as augmenting the existing trail system so as to enable all residents to enjoy better access to this magnificent local landmark. Good words. In 1890, there's a picture of point of rocks from the Charlotte Hall Museum archives. Uh, and even at that time, it was a significant and important natural landmark. And of course, it was associated with the rail line that came through the area and a lot of history associated with that. So the Rails to Trails project, the historical significance of the site is, is immense. Some different views of Point of Rocks. Now, now it gets serious here. This is Arizona Eco Development land, the land in green. It runs all the way from Granite Dells up to Chino Valley. This is the jet, oh, here we, here we can see the Granite Dells. Right here is the junction of the Peavine and Iron King Trails right here, with the Peavine Trail running north up toward Chino Valley and the Iron King Trail running to Prescott Valley. This Jasper development is already happening. It's part of the whole complex here of the development company, and they are building houses on both sides of the Iron King Trail. That is what will happen over here if their proposal 
is not met with uh, some sort of accommodation and collaboration with them. So you can see there's 15,000 acres of land here. It's huge. The only area that the Dells is, occur is right here. This is the area that we're most concerned about. There ought to be a way to protect that landscape. It's a small piece of the big development, and that's what we hope to achieve. Here's a closer look of their Arizona Eco Development land, north and south of 89A. I know you can't read anything here, but it basically, here's the highway. Uh, the airport is right here, and they have some land up there and some land here. Remember, this is still only part of that big 15,000 acres that runs all the way to Chino Valley. Let's take a closer look. Okay, here's the junction of the Peavine and Iron King trails right here. So the Peavine trail runs like this, splits here, and goes over here. The Iron King, this is luckily a state land. So in this initial proposal, and, and this proposal changes, the maps change. I saw a more recent map and some of it was different. But anyway, here is where it is. Open space as designated by the dark green is restricted to the vertical cliffs. <laughs> this is not functional open space. <laughs> It's compi completely fragmented. This is low density residence here with a road across the Iron King Trail. There's road across the Peavine Trail. Road across the Peavine Trail. Pretty well doomed up here anyway because of Grand Dells Estates. All this will be developed except for their little bit of <coughs> non-functional open space that they designated here instead of along the trail. That's uh, a, a bit of a bother for me. Anyway, this is the area that we're most concerned with down here because this is where the beautiful scenery along the trails is and the ecologically important stuff. So here's a view as it stands right now. There's Point of Rocks coming from the south and hooking around here, heading out into the grasslands is the Peavine Trail and the Iron King Trail goes this way over to Prescott Valley. That's what it looks like now. Try to imagine a big resort in there. Try to imagine houses all along there and road crossings and things like that. Try to imagine. Let's not see it happen. Another view from the south, and here's the Storm Ranch Road, going back to the Storm Ranch. Peavine Trail runs out over here someplace, but this is part of that development as well. It's, I see it as the potential heart of the Granite Dells Regional Park. Mm -hmm. Granite Dells Regional Park, our central park, it could be. There's a view along the Iron King Trail. A bit of a, a wash along there with beautiful pine trees and grapevines decking the trees and so forth. I call this Eagle Peak. I don't know if it has a name. I call this Wilkinson Valley because this used to be the Wilkinson Ranch. And I went out there with the Boy Scouts many years ago. They used to have their jamborees out there, mm -hmm. Boy Scout jamborees. Well, this was all land that was sold and then resold again to Arizona Eco Development. So this is what's out there right now. Yeah, they would protect this because they can't build on it, but this whole valley would be at, at risk and become a resort or something like that. This is interesting. This is, of course, granite, but at the top is a bed of latite, which is very similar to the rock on top of Thumb Butte. And so geologically, that's quite interesting. Here's the Peavine Trail presently heading toward the Point of Rocks. And now, again, uh, this is taken from the na a neighborhood in out there, but you can see Granite Dells Estates over here. This is probably going to fill up with houses. The Peavine Trail is running through, so all of this landscape would be uh, converted to houses by the current plan. <coughs> and here's the view toward Granite Mountain. I was taken with my phone, of all things. <laughs> I mean, it's just, that's just how beautiful it is out there. So that's the view from the Peavine Trail, right near one of the benches that you can see as you're going out there. It's absolutely gorgeous landscape. By the current plan, this would all be houses. So that view that I just showed you is what I'm calling Beautiful Valley right here. So here's the Peavine Trail. There's a junction. As it goes north here, you look down this valley. There are springs and seeps and riparian areas that go down to the creek here. It is absolutely beautiful and probably cannot be developed with ecological sensitivity because the fact is wetlands. There's wetlands in there. But of course, laws can be circumvented. And there you can see again that this, this is the area that we are most concerned about protecting. Just this little bit of uh, 15,000 acres that we want to see protected. So here's another view of it. This is our National Recreation Trail. 
Granite Creek is down here, Granite Mountain. There's, this ridge has an archaeological site. There are ruins there. It's an important archaeological site. That could be houses. And so that's our view. And this is the beautiful valley with springs and seeps. Also, we have to remember Granite Creek. Gra the creeks, of course, have been greatly diminished. Wetlands in the state have been reduced by about 90%, and yet maybe 95%, and yet 85% of Arizona's wildlife is dependent on wetland areas, streams, and things like this. And uh, this is actually part of the, this is taken from the old bridge, old 89A bridge, and uh, that is part of the eco-development. This is where the Blackhawks nest, where wood ducks nest, and it's absolutely beautiful, but it would be in the development. Any master plan for the Dells, which I'd like to see, must assure that Granite Creek remains perennial, which means control releases from Watson Lake Dam must be provided. Right now, the dam leaks like a sieve, and a lot of water goes down the creek, and it's perennial. But they're plugging that leak, and <laughs> which is maybe okay, but they're plugging the leak, and then it's going to depend on the goodwill of those who are controlling the dam to release water so the creek remains perennial. CWAG really needs to be on top of this. I think it's really important because water rights are going to be exchanged in this deal. There have been diversions for irrigation because there is some water rights that goes to this particular property as an old ranch, but the long-term vitality of the creek means having year-round flow and protecting the wood ducks that nest there. I just love the wood ducks and we're so lucky to have them as a symbol of Granite Creek in Granite Dells. Well, a big question, and Gary brought it up before, will Arizona Eco Development have an impact on regional water supply? Well, of course it will. They have water rights, but notwithstanding, the aquifer is going to drop. They're going to draw on the Little Chino Aquifer. Safe yield becomes an ever greater oxymoron. It already is, but it becomes even more so with this. And we know they're going to have some water for development because they have some rights. They want uh, annexation because they want some more water from the city. Maybe that's a little bit of a uh, leverage point that we can use to at least limit the damage to the Dells. That's our primary goal, some of us, our primary goal. Obviously, we'd love not to see 4,000 homes come in, but maybe if we can zone them so that they're not damaging the Dells, we will have won something. So here again, you can see Arizona Eco Development, all of this, and the city has assets and prestige that they desire. They are already allowed to build one house every two acres by county zoning. That is not what they want. They don't want to have lots of scattered houses, one house per two acres, because to provide infrastructure for that is just uh, really not acceptable. Putting wells into the ground here and there, septic tanks. Not that I'm antiseptic, but well, yes I am. I'm antiseptic. <laughs> 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 but they have assets and prestige that the uh, developer wants, and that gives us some leverage. They want annexation, and annex uh, a planned area development is not a necessarily a bad thing. If it's done well, if you work on the planned area development, 25% at least has to be open space, and there are other th considerations that you can put into it. So there's going to be hearings at planning and zoning, there'll be hearings at city council, and this is where we as citizens really need to step up. We need to be there, we need to represent the facts, represent our desires as Arizona Eco-Development has asked us to do. Can we work with them to achieve mutually desirable goals? I hope so. Again, think of this all filled with houses. It's a, s a scary thought. Again, 15,000 acres, can we negotiate a development plan that protects that small little piece down here? That's all we're asking for. Uh, protect the unique Granite Dells and Arc Trails, the Peavine and Iron King. Too late to save Jasper, Prescott Valley did not step up, and it's happening. I hope it's not too late to save this. This is a lot of land. Do you see the highway running through here? That's a new highway that's coming through here if, uh, by proposal. But it's interesting, Arizona Eco Development has proposed an alternative to that in which they cut through the state lands and uh, increase their opportunities for more housing development. It's really kind of interesting to see. <laughs> In modifying the map. Okay, the public wants open space and loves the Dells. That's very clear. It came out in polls. It's come out in many other forms. It's come out with the Save the Dells group that has formed recently in response to this threat. And uh, they're awakening. 
So let me read this. This is from the SaveTheDells.org, and there's their contacts. Save the Dells harnesses the power of an all-volunteer group of local citizens to permanently protect the remaining undeveloped portions of the Granite Dells as public open space using creative media, public organizing, advocacy, and the law to achieve our vision of creating one of the most spectacular public parks in America. Beautiful statement. Beautiful statement. <laughs> They'll be passing out flyers at the end. <laughs> and the city, through its master plan, wants open space. Here it says, Prescott, this is from their master plan. It says, Prescott desires to promote a moderate rate of growth, not fast, to preserve and protect critical areas of open space, environmental assets, significant natural, prehistoric, and historic resources. We could substitute Granite Dells for that phrase. The city is following the open space master plan and its revisions, and Mayor Mal Mangarelli says that it's important to keep as much open space as possible in Granite Dells. Let's follow that lead. Arizona Eco Development wants to protect the Dells, according to their website. They say, maximize open space, preserving the point of rock and augmenting the existing trail systems to enable all residents to enjoy better access to this magnificent local landmark. And they say, our team is composed of good corporate citizens who are infused with community spirit, with a sense of responsibility. We want to be good custodians. Yes, <laughs> we want them to be good custodians, and let's hope they will. I hope that they're serious about this. Let's talk with them. Let's make sure that we can... Uh, Help them achieve their goal, <laughs> all right? If it's true that all sides want to preserve the Dells, then a win-win deal should be possible. So let's get all the stakeholders together, including us. We're stakeholders here, and create a plan that serves us all. Prescott has a fortunate conjunction of geography, culture, livability, and economic strength. Granite Dells contributes to all of these. Can we recognize and preserve this community asset? I hope so. Aldo Leopold wrote, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it does otherwise. That's actually taken from my deck. <laughs> we have choices. An enlightened electorate and informed activism are essential. This is the current <coughs> Peavine Trail running out to Point of Rocks out here. This is the Storm Ranch Road. All of this area in here could be houses. <coughs> That is where it stands right now. The future of Prescott, this view is taken Thumb Butte from Granite Dells, will be determined by our wisdom, vision, strength, and commitment. A regional park that retains wildness, wildness <coughs> right next to our urban area would be our greatest gift to the future of Prescott. So please do what you can to assure a high quality of life and a vibrant economy for Prescott by saving the Dells. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm glad you also love the Dells. I'm just a voice for those rocks, but uh, I'm so glad that you're listening to my voice. Thank you. Questions? Thank you very much, yeah. Walt. Um, if you'll raise your hand, I'll bring the microphone to you. You may think you talk loud enough for people to hear you, but you really need the microphone. So here you go, Sandy. Thank you very much, Walt. What is the size of the property that uh, you would like to see protected? What would be the cost for buying that property? And uh, if it can't be bought, uh, if we're interested in having development set aside 25% of its total land, um, that would um, give us uh, 3,700 acres uh, that uh, Echo Development should preserve. Okay, great. I think you can still hear me with my microphone built in here. Um, I don't know the exact acreage. Um, and I pointed it out on that diagram. It, it, seems to be, it seems to be a very minor part of that. Now, there'll be some other open space that I think is going to be important along the Peavine Trail as it extends up to Chino Valley. And I've talked with Chris and Joe about this. And they, they have the big picture. It's good to talk to them about it. They recognize that we're going to want some open space along the trail, as, if possible, as well. And again, that's going to depend on cooperation with Arizona Eco Development. So I don't know the exact amount. There is still $1.7 million left in the open space acquisition fund that the city has that theoretically could be used to par provide part of this buffer that we would like to see. 
It is also possible, I don't know what the total cost would be because we haven't talked to the developer <coughs> about it. It seems to me like it would be to the developer's advantage to save that open space area as an amenity for the development as well because it raises property values. You could really put the high-priced houses on the area that looks toward this open space. The trails could go from there and this could be a tremendous asset to them. So they may not lose any money at all by just backing off on their plan and reorganizing it there a little bit. The challenge becomes if they try to do this development in the small pieces like I showed those two parcels there, 25% of that might not be enough if they just do that and then they deal with the other parts later. If they look or if the city asks them to look at the full 15,000 acres, then we should be able to get the whole 25% without paying a dime. But that's going to depend a part on negotiations. There is also that possibility of public support raising money or having some uh, benefactors raising enough money, combining with the city prefers to have private-public partnerships. They prefer to have uh, a situation where the citizens contribute and they match or something like that. So that's another possibility. And there, I'm a naturalist and uh, artist and photographer and educator. I don't understand all of these little details because I'm not political. But some of you in here may be political or knowledgeable about that. And I certainly would encourage you to use your expertise, wisdom, and passion to help, uh, help this come. Those are all really good questions. Did I miss anything? Okay, great. Yes? Do the developers have names? Are they local people? Or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they do. The, the owner is actually a Swanson, uh, who is uh, a billionaire. I think, uh, s I think some of the fortune was associated with uh, England, but I believe some of his family lives in New York. I don't know if they have seen this property. I do know that they want to have this be an eco-development. That is I think their stated goal, but it didn't come out that way in the early plans. It didn't come that way. Jason Giese is the local representative. Jason used to be on our board of the Granite Dells Preservation Foundation, and Jason has said that he wants this community to be a nice livable place for his kids and his grandkids in the future. That's why I was a bit shocked by the plan that uh, incorporated the Granite Dells in that because I didn't see that coming. I don't think many of us saw that coming. Now every developer is going to put a plan out there that they expect to be challenged and they expect to compromise. And so I'm hoping that they put a little bit too much on there on their plan, knowing that they would be forced to compromise and that we can get this. So their plan is not set in stone. Their plan has already changed. I think they've removed at least one road crossing over the, over the uh, P-Vine. And it is certainly something that we can influence. So if if somebody knows Swanson or can get to Swanson and get Swanson out here and talk to him or his family, that might be another way to, uh, to do it as well. Or talk directly to Jason. Jason's a reasonable guy, I think. I used to be. <laughs> I hope so. Good question. All right, well. Yeah, let's we run out of time. People with the microphone. Okay, and great. So I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, you can, make, you can make the call then. Okay. First, I want to say thank you for all your hard work and your passion, and you are a treasured natural resource to this community <laughs> as far as <laughs> I'm thank concerned. You. Thank you. Thank you. And my question is, you have a, there's a lot of people here, more people yeah. than I've ever seen for any meeting in this room, and I'm curious, what can we do? What is your group asking of us as citizens? How can, how can we help? Well, you can go to the website, there's uh, the Save the Dells website, uh, they have a Facebook page, and I think you can help to spread the word. Uh, I know in some ways we're speaking to the, preaching to the crowd here, is that right word? <laughs> preaching, <laughs> preaching to the choir. And so we need to reach out to a lot of other people because I think many, many people in this town do appreciate the, the Granite Dells and they have no knowledge of the fact that it is not protected. And so I really think we need to have a lot of outreach and education and support. We need to work with our council and uh, work cooperatively and collaboratively. That's always my mantra is to be collaborative rather than conf confrontational because I think you get a lot farther if you're collaborative and I hope we can do that. So talk with the mayor and the council and the Planning and Zoning Commission. I think those things would be there. If you have access to the developer, that would be another good thing. So. Uh, but they're going to be asking for shows of support. So planning and zoning hearings and uh, city council hearings, that's your opportunity to make it well known. Write letters to the editor. Some people read the paper. 
<laughs> and uh, that would be a good idea. City Barks does a good job of reporting on this. I'm happy about that. But we can all get involved. Thank you. You have the mic. Okay. Yeah, um, you mentioned the Blackhawks that nest in the granite yeah. dells. And is it true that there are only a couple of uh, breeding pairs of Blackhawks in the whole state and that one of them is in the dells? They're a rare bird, and there's more than a couple. Okay. They, they migrate uh, along. Breeding uh, pairs, though. Breeding pair, yeah, there's more than two breeding pairs, but we have at least two breeding pairs along Granite Creek. Uh, one out there in the Dells and one in Watson Woods. And possibly, I see them hanging around Willow Creek. Uh, Carl, are there other breeding pairs around? Not confirmed. Not confirmed, right. So it's just a couple breeding pairs here, and they're breeding quite rare, right. Maybe a couple of dozen black hawks along the upper birdie. Yeah. Including one nest that I have photographed. So right. There, there, are there are a few. Exactly. So calling common blackhawk is only to distinguish them from the great blackhawk of the tropics, but they're not common here. <laughs> right. It Who's next? Uh, All right. It was my understanding that uh, approval of this whole development was dependent on them, upon them annexing 1,800 acres outside of the Dells. Were they successful in that or not? Of getting this so they could get more water rights from the city? That's what we believe their intention is. They want annexation. It has yeah, not happened Yeah, but they haven't yet. had it yet. No, unlike the, uh, the Deepwell Ranch, yeah. some agreements were made in the, in the past. Yeah. But uh, at this point, their proposal should come forth, as Gary said, in the next couple months. And uh, they, they want annexation because they don't have enough dedicated water, water at this point. But they can probably get it one way or another. And uh, we might say, if they don't want to cooperate, we could use pressure to stop the annexation. Right. Because it's, uh, it's a very large development, it has to be approved by council, and I think two council members could turn it down, annexation. Now, we think that annexation would probably be a benefit if we can get a proper compromise. So we're not opposed to annexation as long as they compromise and save the Dells. But if they don't, then that is another tool in the, in the toolkit. Thank you. All right. by Boulder Mountain LLC on Granite Dells Road. I don't know anything about it. Does anybody here know anything about, about that one? That's Mark Worst. That's a swimming pool. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. I do know a lot about the Mark Worth property. Okay. But there, are, there are flags up right where Granite Dells Road makes the turn. I think it's across from where Storm Ranch comes in. Right. And... It, so is Boulder Mountain, is that the owner of the um, swimming hole? Yeah, Mark Worth, that's okay. right. I, I didn't okay. recognize the name So Boulder that's Mountain. not s probably going to be a that, subdivision. That was the property we saw as the highest uh, priority for acquisition, and we tried really hard. But Mark had other plans, and Mark is uh, presently, he's put up a fence near the resort. At one time, he was going to donate the buildings there to the Grant Dells Preservation Foundation and so forth. He had conflict with the city council at the time. They thought he was asking too much money for what he paid for it. They had a conflict. And then ECOSA uh, funder wanted to buy that property for, uh, for ECOSA, which would have protected it for open space. And they offered him the $4 million that he wanted, and he turned it down, So he's, uh, which was a big surprise. It caught everybody off guard because we'd had local community meetings and things like that. We thought it was going to happen. So he has been carving roads through the place, put up a fence near there. He's planning on a glamping adventure, glamour camping with tent cabins and things like that, uh, possibly zip lines coming down off the rocks there from the right next to the city property. This is a vital property with, uh, for the connection of the Lake to Lake trails. Still possible we can negotiate a uh, easement perhaps through that property, but that's not been going very well. There's some conflicts going on there. So that was a big loss because we thought that was going to be in the bag. He could certainly develop that property. He, was, he proposed a trailer park there in the past, and uh, the county wanted him to widen the road. He decided he didn't want to spend money to widen the road, so he backed off at that time. Uh, Mark has a lot of interest in the history of the Dells. Uh, really thought he was going to be supportive of, of what happened, but things, things are changed. And he's also 
working with the Storm Ranch people, possibly acquiring some land back there, maybe for development. So that is a bit of a worry. That is definitely a worry. And uh, there's going to be some horse trading going on there, but thank you for bringing that up. Who's got the mic? I got it. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> All right. Uh, it seems to me that a lot of this process is backwards. In other words, you wait till a developer comes in, sucks up all the land, and then you have to try to fight the developer yep. for something that shouldn't happen to begin with. What's the chance of actually having land designated as essential to the community of Prescott and its people in the future? All of that land would be designated, taken away from development possibility. Any developer that wants to come in would then need to understand that uh, you can build out there, but you cannot build here. This is permanently preserved land, okay, and do it by zoning rather than trying to fight with these developers all the time. Yeah, wonderful suggestion. Uh, we're being forced to be reactive because nobody was proactive. Now, the Granite Dells Foundation, uh, well, actually, it, it arose out of that open space acquisition uh, committee. Our desire was for an open space commission and for an open space foundation, which would have done a Granite Dells master plan. And that unfortunately did not happen because of that unfortunate election in which the committee was disbanded and the, and the commission was not formed. That was a real setback because that was the opportunity to do a master plan out here and to create the opportunity for exactly what you said. Now, right now that property is zoned in county and by, rights, by the rights of the zoning there, they could put one house every two acres, they could put wells and septics in and so forth out there. They don't want to do that, they want to be annexed, but which gives the city some leverage. I think the city has some leverage to try to assure that the future of our community includes a significant amount of open space out there. But it's, I don't think it's too late to create some sort of a parks commission or something like that. Uh, through the city, and again, I don't know how you do that legally, but a Parks Commission has worked in other towns very well. It's private-public uh, partnership, and I think something like that could be very effective if we can have some leaders step up and willing to do it. Of course, I'd support it if it happened. It's not something I know how, how to do, but it, you're really right. We should be, it should have been proactive instead of reactive. Totally right. Yes? I have a quick comment. Um, historically, it was beautiful to hear all that history. And back in 95 or so, Open Space Alliance, another group yeah. that started working with Open Space came into being with Elizabeth Ruffner and others, George Sheets, the last past president, I think, of it. And if you want more information on things like Pea Mountain, Glassford Hill, Brenda Smith, who's at the back door, and I archived all that at Charlotte Hall last year, Elizabeth okay. Ruffner's files. So cool. it's there. Yeah. Anything, you, all you want to read is there if you want to go look at it. And grab one of these from she or I at either door on Save the Dells, pass it on to somebody. You already got it in your brain. Talk to somebody. Thanks, Thanks. for your question. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay. Just a second for the microphone. All right, thanks. Uh, the Acosa group has picked up that land on the other side of 89. Right. Um, are there any other groups like Acosa that are uh, currently active in uh, trying to acquire land and doing some sort of mini development? Acosa, I know, is very ecologically based. So I was wondering if there's anybody else that at this point is active in that sort of an arena. That's a great question. I don't know of anyone else who's doing that. But they, are, they have 80 acres. No, it's less than that. 60 acres, I believe. They have 60 acres on the other side of the highway uh, next to Al Snyder's development there, the canyons, something like that. And they're using that for educational purposes. I've taught some of their students out there already. And uh, that's great. I know they intend to keep that as open space, which is just a compliment to the city's holdings out there. Uh, at this point, we don't have a private group that's doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope that we can persuade the city, which has some resources, to uh, step up and do more out there. Because once this is gone, we will have a lot of regrets. Are there any major plans for that uh, west side of the 89 for development? Uh, 
I don't know for sure. I couldn't say. Well, no, I can't say. Gary. Right. Gary's got a question. Oh, here's a question. Thank you, Walt. That was spectacular. Um, thanks for introducing me. I'm Joe Trudeau. Uh, I'm the chairman of the Save the Dells Political Action Committee. And it, we are organized as a PAC for a very specific reason, and that is to be able to engage with the city in a meaningful way. And um, I wanted to get back to a question that, uh, that a lady had back there. And Walt said, um, go to our website. And just to expand on that, um, on our website, you can sign up for more information. And uh, Save the Dells intends on being uh, the voice for the citizen, for, for the community in terms of how we uh, um, engage in land use planning in the Dells. So by um, signing up for more information, then we can get back to you with action alerts or uh, opportunities to get involved, um, opportunities to comment or be present at the city council for meetings, hearings, planning and zoning, et cetera. Um, so please, if you do visit the website, sign up for, to receive more information and conveniently click on the donate button, um, <laughs> which will enable us to build a nice mobile website because right now our website is best viewed on a desktop computer and the mobile site is, um, is uh, pitiful. Um, <laughs> but we're, we're hoping to expand into a better mobile site. Uh, so I just wanted to give that plug. Oh. And I, I should also mention that Granite Dells Preservation Foundation still exists. It's a nonprofit. You can donate tax deductibly to the Granite Dells Preservation Foundation as well. And our primary goal at this point will be education and interpretation and management, but we can also acquire funds for acquisition. So if you want to donate to that nonprofit, Granite Dells Preservation Foundation, you can also do that. So I think the two groups work together. So Ellie and then Gary. Just a comment, all over the Verde area, you see uh, in businesses, little places to donate little cash for Save the Verde. It would sure be nice to see that in businesses all around Prescott, oh. Save the Dells. Mm -hmm. You know, that sends a really powerful message to the yeah. community yeah. Uh, that this is something we want to save. So may it be something for your organizations to think about. I think that's an excellent idea, and if somebody would love to that project. <laughs> <laughs> I will, I will that with enthusiasm today. <laughs> Gary Beverly. <laughs> okay, so I just wanted to go over uh, the water piece. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, the. Okay. Relax. <laughs> um, it. This is totally wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Sure. You're welcome. Um, so CWAG is really happy to present this issue to, to you all. Um, so the Save the Dells organi organization is the kind of the activist arm for the, to protect this land. CWAG's piece of this is water. So um, let me just review for you where we are now. Um, so based on what you read in the newspaper, um, DC has, Arizona Echo Development, has 375 acre feet of surface water rights they acquired with the purchase of the property. They are proposing to give that water to the city. Um, and where the city would then take the 375 and run it into their recharge ponds out near the airport. Um, so they're going to lose at least 5% of it there. So, it'll, so then the city would then. Um, supply 375 less 5% or some there's going to be a discount on it. We don't know what that is. They would supply that much um, water back to the development that would come from the municipal system. So that water then would then come from the city's well field in Chino Valley. So that would, um, in the large scheme of things, then that's kind of an even trade, you know. Uh, that 375 acre feet was historically applied to uh, agricultural enterprises on the Wilkinson's land, and there that water um, was used by plants and evaporated. If the 375 goes to uh, the, the development, because this development is over 250 acres in size, it applies uh, under Proposition 400, which requires that all the effluent from the development 
is um, sent to permanent recharge that cannot be recovered and reused. So that would actually help safe yield, that part of it. Um, now, 375 acre feet of water is enough to do how many homes? Well, just roughly speaking, under current policies, without doing any water conservation work, just multiply it by three. So just call it 1,000 homes, roughly. Well, Giese's plan was for 3,300 homes, but this is changing. But at any rate, 375 acre feet is not enough to do what he envisioned for this first part of his land. I think it was like 1,800 acres is what roughly what he was proposing. Again, this isn't really well known, and we won't know until we see the annexation proposal, the final one. So we're not even talking about the whole 15,000 here. We're just talking about a piece of it, and the 375 he got with the land purchase is inadequate to accomplish his development goal. So he needs more water. Where can he get it? He could ask the city for water. The, the city has some water left in its, what they call their alternative water fund. And uh, so that's a possibility. Um, another source for water would be to purchase extinguishment credits. Now, when f under the, um, in the active management area, when the, a farmer retires his land from irrigation, he can convert his grandfathered irrigation water right into an extinguishment credit according to a formula that ADWR has. And many farmers in Chino primarily have done this. And then those extinguishment credits can be used to prove the 100-year water supply that's required for new subdivisions. So uh, those extinguishment credits are available on the open market for purchase. Uh, Giese has acquired 126 acre feet per year for 100 years worth of extinguishment credits. And so that gives him about 500 acre feet of water total for his development. So now we're up to 1,500 homes. So typically in Prescott, about 30% of the groundwater that's pumped from Chino Valley is used seasonally, that is to evaporate, it, it's applied to landscapes, and so it's evaporated and lost. It's not recovered in the sewer system, it's not recharged. So if CWAG's line of thinking here is that if this development could use aggressive water conservation measures, particularly into controlling landscape irrigation that um, they could reduce the water demand. Um, he could actually use the available water more efficiently and that that would be a good thing. So our recommendation here to the planning and zoning and the council has to do with cutting landscape water use going to drought tolerant plants, low water use plants, and using um, rainwater harvesting. So that's CWAG's piece of this, and I just wanted to explain that. And when it comes up to, we, what we wanna do is we wanna give our members kind of talking points explaining this. So when it, this comes up to the planning and zoning, we, we'd like to help you make um, useful comments. Okay. This is the end of, yeah. Okay. Minutes. All right. Somebody have the microphone or? Right here. Oh, right okay. Here. Does somebody need the microphone? <laughs> That's the other question. There you go. Okay. Well, I think this is the end of the public portion of the meeting. I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank you for your responsiveness to Grand Adels, which is such an important resource. I really want to encourage you to get involved and to spread the word. Uh, I think we really need to network work at every angle that we can because this is a really critical juncture and we need to make a difference. So I'll be around in case somebody has personal questions, but thank you all for coming very much.
you have a card.